Hi there, everyone. Welcome to The Daily Gardener. I'm your host, Jennifer Eveling. It's May 6th. We are on the cusp of continuous warm nights. Warm soil temps will take a few more weeks. Recently, I had a gardener ask me about their hardy hibiscus that was planted last year. They were worried it wasn't coming back. In Minnesota, gardeners often start to freak out a bit if they don't see signs of life during these first sunny days in May. But remember, warmer weather plants won't start to do their thing until soil temps warm up. And the soil temp has about a two to three week lag on the nighttime air temp. Here's today's brevities. On this day in 1742, Jean Senebier, a Swiss pastor and botanist, was born. Where would we be without Senebier? Still breathing, but not realizing that carbon dioxide is consumed by plants, and in turn, that plants produce oxygen as part of the process of photosynthesis. In a nutshell, Senebier's work is important because he had learned the function of leaves, capturing carbon for food. It was Jean Senebier who said, observation and experiment are two sisters who help each other. On this day in 1806, along the banks of Idaho's Clearwater River, Lewis and Clark discovered the nine-leaf Lomatium, Lomatium triternatum. A species of flowering plant in the carrot family and known by the common name nine-leaf biscuit root, the nine-leaf lamadium is so named because each leaf divides into three narrow leaflets that in turn divide into three more. Tridernatum from the Latin means three times three. In 2018, the National Institutes of Health reported the case of a woman who had taken Lomadium extract in a bottle marked LDM-100 for the flu, and she ended up with a severe rash all over her body for a week. The title of the article, Worse Than the Disease, the Rash of Lomadium Dissectum. On this day in 1859, the naturalist and botanist Alexander von Humboldt died. He was 89 years old. In 1806, the artist Frederick Georg Veitch painted his portrait two years after he had returned from his five-year research trip through Central and South America. Veitch painted a romantic, idealized vista of Ecuador as the setting for the painting. Humboldt had climbed the Chimborazo Mountain in Ecuador, believed at the time to be the highest mountain in the world. So perhaps Veitch was imagining him viewing the landscape from Chimborazo. Surrounded by a jungle paradise, a large palm shades Humboldt's resting spot. In the painting, a very handsome some Humboldt is seated on a large boulder. His top hat is resting upside down on the boulder behind him. And Veitch shows the 37-year-old Humboldt wearing a puffy shirt that would make Seinfeld jealous, a pink-orange vest, and tan breeches. In his lap, he holds open the large leather-bound flora he is working on. And in his right hand, he has a specimen of Mariania speciosa. A large barometer leans against the boulder in the lower left corner of the painting, and that symbolized Humboldt's principle of measuring environmental data while collecting and describing plants. King Ferdinand was so pleased with the portrait, he hung it in the Berlin Palace, and he ordered two more paintings to be made featuring Humboldt's time in the Americas. Humboldt was a polymath. He made a safety lamp for miners. He discovered the Peru Current, now called the Humboldt Current. He believed South America and Africa had been joined together geographically at one time. He named the Torrid Zone the area of the earth near the equator. And Humboldt was also a pragmatist. He said, spend for your table less than you can afford, for your house rent, just what you can afford, and for your dress, more than you can afford. Humboldt developed his own theory for the web of life. He said, 
Everything is interaction in his Mexican diary in 1803. On this day, after a five-year, 41 million pound restoration, temperate house reopened to the public on this day in 2018. The ironwork was stripped and repainted with many coats, 15,000 panes of glass were replaced, 69,000 sections of metal, stone, and timber repaired or replaced. Home to 10,000 plants, some are the world's rarest and most threatened. Q's temperate house is the largest Victorian glass house in the world. In unearthed words, the annual meeting of the Massachusetts Horticultural Society was held at Horticultural Hall on May 6th, 1946. Here's an excerpt from their delightful minutes. At the end of the war, we were met with this question, will interest in gardening continue to grow or will there be a falling off? We proceeded on the assumption that fewer vegetable gardens would be made, but that, on the other hand, a greater number of people than ever before would turn their attention to the growing of ornamental plants. It's the duty of each one of us to plant a home garden. Almost all the events and developments of 1945 to 1946 center upon our return to peacetime living. In the reading room, visitors are no longer predominantly in uniform. The questions a year ago were often about the plants of the Pacific or what a gardener should visit while stationed in Boston. Now they're most often on the design of small home properties, the choice of good plant materials, the fine points of flower gardening, or the management of a greenhouse. Today's book recommendation is The Invention of Nature, Alexander von Humboldt's New World by Andrea Wolff. Wolf traces Humboldt's influences through the great minds he inspired, and she brings this lost hero and the forgotten father of environmentalism back to life. For today's garden chore, if you're a mom, Mother's Day is coming up. Start thinking about the colors and plants you'd like for your front containers, and then make a list for your kids. For years, I did this with my kids, and they spent a decade of Mother's Days helping me plant the annuals they had bought for me in the front planters and hanging baskets. It was a fantastic photo op, and it was a wonderful way to get them involved in setting the stage for beauty around the front door and getting them to notice the annuals. Many happy memories with this chore. Finally, here's something sweet to ignite the little botanic spark in your heart. On this day last year, the Hudson, Massachusetts Garden Club celebrated their 50th anniversary. The club began in 1968 as a group of 16 friends and neighbors shared their love of flowers and gardening. Today, the club has 41 members. It's a lovely thing to combine your love for gardening and beautifying the community, all while having a good time. Thanks for listening to The Daily Gardener, and remember, for a happy, healthy life, garden every day. The Daily Gardener is produced weekdays in lovely Maple Grove, Minnesota. You can find complete show notes over at thedailygardener.org, and be sure to share the show with your garden friends. You can find The Daily Gardener on all your favorite social media, Instagram, Twitter, and Pinterest, and of course, Facebook. While you're over at Facebook, don't forget to join The Daily Gardener community. Just search for these three words, Daily Gardener Community. The group will pop right up and then request to join. Finally, I want to thank my team at Podfly Productions, where my fabulous editor is Eric Begay. Have a great day in the garden, and we'll see you tomorrow.